This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. On today's Shorter Than Usual installment, we're going to cover the the book The Age of Propaganda by Anthony Pratkanis and Elliot Aronson. I think that's right. Aronson? Aronson? Hey. Well, as for who recommended the book, it was Ramit Sethi. Why don't you tell us a little bit about him, Eric? Yeah, he's an American personal finance advisor and entrepreneur. And he is the author of a book written in 2009. I'm not totally sure what it's about, but it's called I Will Teach You to Be Rich. No, uh, no, no, um, no boldness in that title. Yeah, it's a subtle one. Very subtle. Yeah. Yeah. As for the authors themselves, uh, Anthony Prekkanis, and I'm just going to go with Aronson, Elliot Aronson. Uh, someone I'm sure in the audience is going to correct me at some point on this. I'm, I'm sure I'm getting this wrong. But in any, in any case, uh, Pratkanis is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, you've got an interesting tidbit to share on this one. Yeah, he's an amateur magician. And as part of his psychology courses, and, and he's, a, he's a professional in the area of propaganda, uh, hence, hence this book. But he um, he loves showing his students that he can fool them, and so part of what he does is is magic tricks during class to show how easily uh, people can uh, people can be fooled. So, yet again, confirming my theory that all university professors are failed entertainers <laughs> of some sort. So, you know, all university professors are amateur com- comedians who weren't good enough to make it in comedy or, you know, amateur ma- magicians who weren't good enough to make it as illusionists, et cetera, or, you know, just got tired of working so many, you know, seventh grade parties and decided that they'd work required. They'd have a, a captive audience of, you know, people a little older than seventh grade, but with roughly the same maturity. So yeah, that's uh, that just further confirms my hypothesis on that one. Any ca- in any case. <laughs> well, and, and we didn't we see that in a couple of books last year of professors being mu- magicians. Uh, it wasn't Feynman interested in. in yeah, magic. he was interested in, in illusions and so on. Yeah, although he was he didn't you know, he didn't incorporate that all that much into his into his lectures and so on. He was just a, a or, or in, so in, um, developing the atomic bomb. He didn't didn't do any magic tricks there. Yeah, well. Anyway, yeah, and then so, you've got the co-author. Aronson, he's yeah. a little older, um, and, and they make that clear at the beginning that they are of different generations. Um, but Aronson, best known for his groundbreaking experiments on the theory of cognitive dissonance, uh, according to Wikipedia. And he has Aronson's first law, which is people who do crazy things are not necessarily crazy. Uh, so, and that is an important law, one that we've talked about in other words on this uh, podcast previously. For example, yep. Adolf Hitler, not crazy, yep. evil, but not crazy. And that's that's much scarier. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yep. Yeah. So uh, in this book, Eric's the one that read it. I uh, chose not to read this book. Uh, I, I, I took the old college pass on that one. Uh, and, uh, so I'm going to be interviewing Eric on this. Uh, this, like I said, a little bit shorter episode this, uh, this time through, but, uh, Eric, what, what are your initial, initial reactions? What's it? First of all, the overview of the book, what's the book really getting at and to whom is this book directed? Well, it, it follows, uh, a, a lot of the other books that we read last year. So I'm, I'm glad you didn't read it. And, this, it, it's, it's in the line of psychology and, and Feynman's famous quote of 
be careful not to get fooled and you're the easiest person to fool. Uh, another book on how not to get fooled. And, and here's how people are going to try to fool you. This, this book in particular really hits on more of the media side of things in, in news and, and also some, some politics. So some of the other books last year were mistakes were made, but not by me, the power of persuasion. And, and then also think twice that was, that was another book that was kind of in the same, same vein. And, and if, if you're new to the podcast, what we did last year is we, we picked, there was, a, there was over 150 books that were suggested or most gifted in the body of tools of Titans by, by Tim Ferriss. And then I narrowed that list down to 52 books and, and didn't really think through the fact that four of them would be <laughs> very similar. Redundant. To, yeah. To the point where they used like a lot of the same uh, examples. And so, yeah, by the time I hit this book, I read this in November of, of last year. So by the time I hit this one, I was like, oh, man, not this example again. And I'm, I'm kind of getting tired of, of uh, this line of books. So <laughs> unfortunately, it fell it fell in line there. And, and unfortunately, even more now, uh, we've read some other books that just far surpassed this one. Uh, so. That's that's pretty much my initial reaction is uh, a, li- a little frustrated with that, uh, it, with it being a, a similar book to that to said, some of the we can we can be of service to our listeners in terms of, uh, you know, you've got the eat this, not not that uh, thing. We've got the read this, not that. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. A part of our uh, our contribution to the world here in, in that we've read several of these books that overlap with each other. And it's, eh, you know, this one's a lot better than that one. Yeah. So, and, and in the conclusion, I will, uh, I will say which, which are the ones from last year that I would, I would read. Ooh, um, sneaky. You're holding on to it. Well, not Very sneaky. Gotta listen so that, that, that they have to listen to our, our, our extensive advertising. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Hold them through <laughs> so, the commercial break here. Another uh, another thing about this book is that it, it's a bit dated, and a lot of the examples were were dated. Uh, it was written in '92, updated in 2001, but uh, but yeah, some of the other ones were were more recent, and that shined through in, in a lot of the examples. <laughs> one one thing I did like uh, as part of the these initial reactions is that the the authors would write in such a way that they would would lead you down a path. And they would get you siding with 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 them in, in what they were talking about and what they were announcing, and and then and then they would flip it and and, and tell you exactly what we were, what they were doing and, and how they got you to to go down that line. So I thought that was very effective. I, Jason, I think if you had read it, you uh, you're you're in tune to those kind of things. I'm a little more gullible and, and, <laughs> and just go down. But I think. I think you would have caught on to a lot of those, but I, I like that they did that because it was kind of the point of the whole book of, of, you know, it's very easy for, well, it's in, in keeping with Prakanis, like, you know, Oh, I'm going to trick you. You know, yep. you're going to look over here. Here's what you're going to expect. And then, Nope, that's actually not the, not the right answer. Yeah. Yep. So again, the title of the book age of propaganda. So it's, it's very, uh, very hard on, on that theme and propaganda through political means and uh, news organizations. So I wanted to start off uh, the quote section just by reading one quote towards the beginning. The U.S. government spends more than $400 million per year to employ more than 8,000 workers to create propaganda favorable to the United States. The result? 90 films per year, 12 magazines in 22 languages, and 800 hours of Voice of America programming in 37 languages with an estimated audience of 75 million listeners. I'm kind of surprised it's only 90 films. It's got to be more than that now. Per year? Yeah. I wonder how they're counting. Well, would that be like major? Yeah, major motion pictures, I'm motion sure. Pictures. I mean, if you were going to include yeah. YouTube, then good God. But um, but no, it's got to be more than that now. I'm, I, that's actually interesting. Yeah. And, and again, this is, this, these are probably the... the since it was first written in ninety two, I would I would assume that these are the the quote the stats from ninety two. Yeah, so probably. It, I mean, I doubt that's a, that's not the sort of thing that you tend to update when you when you do an update. Yeah. So uh, hit a few other other quotes here, and and some of these lead into to some of the things that that were interesting about this book. Uh, the next one. 
The primary purpose of propaganda is to get you to like the communicator and to agree with the message. So if you find yourself re readily liking and agreeing with a communicator, this could be a sign that the message was not the truth you thought it was, but just some very effective propaganda. Okay, so listeners, be apprised if you're liking what we're saying here. If, if at any point you like something that we're saying, it's because we're smooth and not because we're telling the truth. So, yep. So yeah. And that was one comment Suave I had on that. Como mantequilla. <laughs> uh, what comment I had on that quote is, or the, the communicator was actually speaking the truth. That could be the other side of it. But so. always beware of the person who tells you what you want to hear. I mean, that's, I think, I think that's a big part about that. If you leave happy with what you heard, be careful that you didn't just hear what you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Or you weren't just told what you, what you were, what you wanted to hear. So here's a quote, uh, not from the authors, but from someone named Bernard Cohen. The mass media may not be successful much of the time in telling people what to think, but it is stunningly successful in telling its readers what to think about. The world will look different to different people depending on the map that is drawn for them by writers, editors, and publishers of the papers they read. I mean, th this seems like a pretty obvious statement. And, and when I read that, I... I, I immediately think to the New York times where it says all the news that's fit to print. Uh, but there, you know, there's a lot of choice involved in that in, in what gets printed. And in, in another part of this book, they say at least 60% of what's in the times any day is uh, just taken from other, other places. It's not, you know, unique to, to the, to the times. So yeah, it's about their curation of that, of that material. Mm -hmm. So another thing to, to, to be aware of, you know, um, how people cu curate uh, the news and, and, and what you see of it. Um, I mean, it's always shocking going to other countries and, and seeing different news sources and, oh, wow, it's not, it's not 95% based around the United States. Huh. There's other things going on. That's, that's <laughs> interesting. So uh, next one, the essence of propaganda is a well-designed package. <laughs> This one just made me think of uh, my entrepreneurship professor in college who in, in grad school, he would he would tell how he would correspond with with news media. And, and he would he would put together a well-designed package. He would he would put together a whole folder, write out exactly what he wanted them to say and give them just like, a, you know, on a platter like here, here. And he said. The majority of the time they would they would take that and print it as is or read it exactly how he had written it. Um, and so I, I, that always sticks in my mind. But the essence of propaganda is a well-designed package. Just kind of tying in with that first one of if you agree with the message or the communicator, just beware. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, again, you always want to make sure in, in communicating with the media or anything else. I mean, you always want to make sure to have a well-designed package. I mean, that's that goes without saying in terms yep. of getting your message forward. Yep. Uh, here's one from. Uh, uh, is a Ger Goebbels? Yeah, Goebbels. What the masses term truth is that information which is most familiar that is, and and we as we've discussed on in the uh, in the Kahneman episode, uh, that is that has been demonstrated multiple times in behavioral psychology. Is this idea that rep, that repetition, familiarity with with the subject, actually gets mistaken for truth uh, mm -hmm. very easily, and uh, and so people identify that which is most familiar as that which is true. And you know, Goebbels recognized this back. In back, you know, in the in the thirties, and uh, did a lot of evil things with it. But uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and obviously that that came in in a chapter where um, they talk about you know just keep just keep repeating something and and um, you repeat that message over and over and people start to believe it. So um, this this was an interesting quote. I want to. I want to hear what you think about this one, Jason. I was uh, was a little shocked at this one. The most dangerous aspect of Nazi propaganda, however, was its assumption that there was an absolute truth and that the ruling elite alone are privileged to know this truth. 
Does that sound like the most dangerous aspect of Nazi propaganda to you? No, um, not the most dangerous aspect of Nazi propaganda. But uh, I mean, for one, the idea that there is absolute truth is not exactly um, super dangerous. That that that's okay. Uh, you know, most people historically have believed something along those lines. But Nazism's special uh, emphasis on the uh, on on this uh, on on the elites talking down to the masses, I do think that that was something that was distinctively uh, distinctively negative about about their particular form of of implementing all that. So that that part I think is is basically right. But I, I wouldn't say that's the most the most pernicious part of Nazi propaganda. But you know, hyperbole. Yeah. All right. Well, my last one, the person who is easiest to persuade is the person whose beliefs are based on slogans that have never been seriously challenged and examined. So pretty much the entire American populace at this point. Yeah. And I wrote, uh, or the, per- the, the person who is educated and has never thought about what they were taught. Well, 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 actually I would say the person, not, not the person who's educated. See, there's a difference between someone who has gotten degrees and has passed through school. About, so I okay, would say the about, person someone, who is schooled, been taught. Yeah, someone, someone who's schooled. Yeah. Someone who's schooled but hasn't been educated. Yeah. And that is first of all that's a tragedy if 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 you wind up there. And secondly, that makes you especially vulnerable. And this is why, you know, a lot of intellectuals uh over the years have especially some of your your polymaths and so on they've warned about or they've sort of sneered at the the college the college folk especially in the prior generations you know these college educated men and so on that would uh flaunt all the knowledge that they got but the knowledge that they got was unreliable they didn't really know what they were talking about and this is you know the goodwill hunting thing where you learn in your masters degree your literature master's degree you learn how to parrot the words of some other people and you learn how to say the right words and do all that what's that god and wood yeah um you learn how to say all the right words and everything but you don't actually really understand how to put them together you don't you don't you, you don't have mastery of the subject in the way that that the people who actually are educated who who understand do and that, yeah. that's a that's that's a big difference it's a big yeah. difference between understanding and being able to parrot what someone else has said about it yeah. uh, and and that's also some somewhat the difference for me the, the person who's educated is going to and the interesting thing is there's such a fine line here between the propaganda end of this well, i'll get to that in a second and and the educational end of this but to me the person who's really educated is going to be the person who's going to read a brilliant thinker and, and, you know, in an area that they've spent some time thinking about or whatever. And then when they get to what that person is saying, they're going to go, oh, th- like it's going to it's going to jive with what they've always kind of known. Mm-hmm. It's like that's what you know, that's what I I've been I've been thinking for so long. But this person just put put great words to it. Mm-hmm. Th- that means you've sort of you have mastery of that of that of that knowledge a little bit more than someone who's fighting to get that and kind of has to, to think through it in, in different ways uh, and, and just parrot what that person has said. No, I can, I can read this and like, Oh, that's a so much better way than, than what I've, I've, I've had to say the same thing, but I've been saying the same thing before. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, now on the flip side, that also can be a dangerous place because you get the person who's saying what you are familiar with and what you understand. And that can also just mean that you've been exposed to propaganda, right? That someone is steering you according to what you want. So you have to be able to distinguish between those and that takes some level of discernment. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, um, I've got a double portion of your favorite section, Jason. Uh Oh, Eric's favorite word. Eric's favorite words. So, what are you, what what are your favorite words from this particular uh, from this particular book? 
First one is factoid. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And the definition is a, f- a fact which or facts which have no existence before appearing in a magazine or newspaper. And I put in parentheses probably now even a greater problem with Wikipedia. Well, I mean, it's like Abraham Lincoln said, you can't trust everything you see on the internet. <laughs> the second one is Grand Faloons. <laughs> Wait, you got to spell that one. G-R-A-N-F-A-L-L-O-O-N-S. Grand Faloons. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is Proud and Meaningless Associations of Human Beings. And... Uh, one section, he says, the modern masters of the Grand Falloon are televangelists. Christian fundamentalist min- ministers such as Oral Roberts, Pat Robertson, Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker, and Tammy Faye, who use television to pro- promote not only the gospel, but also with rapid fire frequency, their sales message. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and also some, well, I guess not anymore, but, you know, the old purple hair, or the big hair thing, you know, that... that some of those ladies had going on. Yep. So it's basically <sighs> like uh, suits. Uh, They've gotten better on the suit game lately. Yeah. Well, they're, they're tailored. Well, I mean, yeah, they're they're definitely tailored. I mean, they're wearing thou- you know multi- multiple thousand dollar suits now. So. Yep. Yeah. So factoid and grand falloons keep. Um, yeah, you gotta you gotta. I think you gotta add. I mean, factoid is a pretty common pretty common one, but grand falloons like that. That's a word I gotta add to my repertoire a little bit proud and meaningless associations of human beings <laughs> <laughs> like the meaningless part yeah that's pretty outstanding all right so let's go ahead and move into uh a few uh, a few additional um i don't know you got any more favorite quotes or that you want to hit or do you uh do you want to just go ahead and hit the uh a little bit of the um the details here beyond the beyond the quotes Let's do some of the nitty gritty. All right, and, let's, uh, let's get some details. So, what what are some of the what are some of the favorite th- favorite details or the things that those of you who are n- probably not going to ever end up reading this book, Eric's going to fill you in on some of the things that uh, that you should know from this book. So, what are some of the details? Yeah, one just uh, hi- historical tidbit that that I was unaware of, but the U.S. and British used extensive propaganda during World War One, and Hitler was very interested in this. Like he, he studied this during world war one. And then, uh, you know, the, the Nazis utilized it to, uh, uh, quite, quite effectively during, during world war two. Um, so it, it, it had, it had a really interesting impact, uh, according to these off uh, authors. So the, the first is what I just said that, it, that, uh, Propaganda during World War One influenced Hitler, and then he he took it and, and ran with it. The second the second thing is that after this propaganda during World War One became known, uh, the authors of this book said it caused people not to trust in the reporting about Hitler's atrocities because they had been, I guess, so much propaganda had come forth that. That, so much uh, false propaganda. And, and that's something that I actually would, would distinguish, right? Because propaganda doesn't necessarily mean that what's being spread is false, right? Yeah. But yeah, so much stuff that turned out not to be true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I found that interesting, you know, um, yeah, just had, hadn't heard uh, that part of it or um, the impact of, of propaganda during, during World War One. And how it impacted World War II, but that's that. The se- second thing, uh, another thing I didn't know, is that um, comparative advantage, uh, uh, comparative advertising was banned in the 1960s in, in the United States. Uh, it was eventually uh, opened up, and when it was opened up, that's when we began to see the term brand positioning come into play. So in the past, you could. It, you know, if, when it was banned in the 60s, you couldn't compare your product to a competitor's product. You just had to, had to talk about your product without without mentioning the other one or, or how yours would, was better than that one. Um, but when that when that was freed up, that's really where you've got the idea of a niche and brand positioning and and um, distinguishing your brand versus the others. And this book goes into a lot about that. 
uh, especially with things like aspirin, where aspirin's the same thing, uh, but y- you see how each company tries to position theirs, and they can be very deceitful in, in how they do that. But um, but you're basically it's 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 going to be the same thing uh, if it's if it's aspirin. So so uh, quick question actually in terms of um, in terms of military, you know, world war propaganda. Did they happen to mention the the carrot propaganda from World War II, which is one of my favorite propaganda stories? No, really? Oh. Oh, well, you know what? I recall it was six months ago. I'm going into but, that one. I, that, that's, all right, let's that, hear that. That's one. one of my favorites. So, all right. you know, like, what, what do you know about carrots and their health benefits? Um, I know that it turns Steve Jobs orange. <laughs> Aside from that, that's all I know. Oh, that it's supposed to help your eyes, right? Ah, really? So you think carrots are really gonna gonna help your eyes, huh? No. Yeah. Well. As it turns out, uh, that is that is part and parcel of one of the uh, most successful propaganda campaigns in history. That, along with the De Beers uh, diamond advertising thing, but maybe the most successful propaganda campaign in history. I'm, I'm confident that this this has got to be top three or four. Is <laughs> that back in the 1940 Blitzkrieg, the German Luftwaffe? Their, their, the German uh, the German Air Force would typically strike England under cover of darkness. So um, <laughs> the and, and in the process, actually, basically the, the British would shut down all the lights of their cities at night to try to make it make it harder for the British pilots to, to hit anything. And then, of course, their pilots would have to be working in, in the darkness as well. But here's the thing is they were somehow able to uh their 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 uh their royal air force the british royal air force was having success shooting down german planes in darkness at night despite the fact that like all the lights of the city are out and the the germans were kind of getting frustrated at this but here's the thing the ministry of information from the british side from the allied allied side they were explaining to the populace the reason they, they told their own people the reason that they were having so much success at night against the Germans is that they uh, is that their pilots had been eating a bunch of carrots and that carrots were give, helping their night vision, basically, that their night vision was being improved. And all, all of this was basically a subterfuge to hide the fact that the British had developed a, uh, a new secret technology called radar. <laughs> they were using airborne interception radar that was actually pinpointing the, the, the Luftwaffe bombers before they even got across the English channel. So they were out, they were able to, to scramble their jets or their, their planes. They weren't jets at that point, but they were able to scramble their planes and their planes were able to pinpoint the location of the bombers in the air because they had onboard radar. Yeah, that and, was definitely not in this book. Yeah, well, as it turns out, people ever since the 40s have believed that carrots will improve your eyesight, which just goes to show how successful the Ministry of Information was in hiding the reason for their real success against the Germans. I love that story. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, well, just, that's just outstanding. When you, when you read the... Uh, Walter Isaacson book about Steve Jobs. He he goes into the carrot thing. I don't know why Steve ate so many carrots, but it definitely didn't help his eyesight because well, he wore glasses. You remember he he started to, especially toward the end, he started to uh, to really try everything in terms of vitamins and all sorts of stuff to to find. Yeah, but his- this was this was this was like at the beginning. Uh, and he ate so many that they said he turned he, like he was orange. <laughs> so I, I want to I, we're going to have to include in the show notes at least one of the old British propaganda um, posters about the yeah. carrots. There, okay. there's, there's one really good one. That's the night sight can mean lighter uh, life or death. Eat carrots and leafy green or yellow vegetables rich in vitamin A essential for night sight. Did they have a be calm and eat carrots one? No, they didn't have that. Keep calm and eat carrots. But uh, yeah, they. <laughs> That's pretty good, man. 
Yeah. I'd never heard of that before. I mean, I, I knew the, uh, I'd heard the carrots and ice age, but didn't know where that was from. <laughs> oh, crazy. Yeah. All right. Um, the last one here, <laughs> I thought this was hilarious. Uh, back in the day, if you fell behind on your cable bills, they would show you C-SPAN. <laughs> so they would, they would remove access to all of the other channels and you would only get C-SPAN. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Which is probably what people should be watching anyway. Oh, God, uh, no. Better citizens, but... No, that doesn't make you a better citizen. No? All right. <laughs> oh, oh. So I'm I'm ready with uh, conclusions. If you are, yeah, I've, I think we can get to that. So um, let, let's go ahead and do it. So we're, let's. This is the this is the time for the read this not that section of the podcast with Eric Rostad. So Eric, uh, after reading this book, what are your uh, what are your takeaways? What are your conclusions? Yeah, like like I said before, um, I mean that. It, there's so many examples that are similar to the to the other books. If if you're particularly interested on the on the media or the news side of things, this is probably the one to read from our uh, 2017 list. But the other ones from our 2017 list, uh, mistakes were made. The power of persuasion. This one, the age of propaganda, and then think twice. They're all very similar. Uh, so if you're going to choose one of those four, I would go with the power of persuasion. But if you're expanding and open to uh, to looking at our 2018 list, I would go with uh, thinking fast and slow and fooled by randomness. A, this is becoming a refrain on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and also fooled by randomness. I, I would put those two together. I would I would just completely disregard the the four that I just mentioned from our, our list of last, from Although last that, year. I mean, again, I do think that 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 reading at least one of the ones from last year. And again, your, your suggestion yeah, on that's yeah, probably right. the same as mine. Yeah. One of those would be good, but I think the other two should be prioritized. Yeah. I agree with that too. Yeah. So yeah, maybe the power of persuasion, which we, we covered before, um, w- would be, would be a better one to read, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it on the, on the conclusion side of things. Nothing, nothing that really stood out, uh, that, that that this would be like a, a definite must read. Um, How do you do a book on propaganda and not do the carrots thing? I mean that that in itself, like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, there there is one other audience, there. one other audience that that might enjoy this book um, are up and coming cult leaders or people who want to become cult leaders because chapter thirty six is titled "How to Become a Cult Leader." So. Yeah, well, we need to make sure we put that in the show notes so that those who are aspiring cult leaders know to uh, to check that out. We'll do, uh, we'll optimize on the search engines yeah, for that. Yeah, SEO that, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, well, I mean, I guess there's not, not a whole lot more to talk about on this one. So once again, that's going to do it for us here on this episode of Books of Titans. Before we go, just a reminder that if you have not subscribed to this podcast, please do so if you enjoyed this episode. And uh, let others know about the podcast. Uh, r- rate and review us on uh, on Apple uh, Apple Podcasts in particular, iTunes, uh, or whatever, and whatever uh, whatever avenue you tend to uh, to use, whatever podcast manager you tend to use. Uh, those ratings and reviews help us out a lot. You can also ping us, discuss all sorts of stuff with us on social media at Books of Titans. That's at Instagram, Facebook, wherever. We'll be back next week with another episode, but until then, keep listening, keep reading, and keep improving. Thanks for listening. I made this.